It's referees and walking canes. It's the outdated wrestling hour once again. Allentown, Pennsylvania. This is the newest edition of the Outdated Wrestling Hour with Bob Smith. That's me, formerly with Pro Wrestling Illustrated, formerly with a bunch of other magazines, and uh, soon to be of a second podcast. Actually, it should be out right about now. We've just started the Outdated Entertainment Hour podcast. Look for that if you're in the mood to talk about entertainment, TV, radio, all that kind of stuff, comedy, you name it. It's going to be a second Bob Smith production. Well, in any event, back to wrestling and back to... I I want to give a little more hype to a really great book called Run With The Bulls. You know, Eric Johnson's a -a one-of-a-kind comedian, and he had a -a one-of-a-kind granddad and father who were both professional wrestlers, as we've talked about in a previous episode. Well, I talked to Greg Oliver about the book once on the show, and now we have Joseph Cachado is here. And we're going to talk about his participation in the book and his life in wrestling. That'll be really interesting. But I also have something here to uh, talk about. I notice in a lot of other wrestling podcasts that uh, people read letters from the people who listen to the show. This one really touched me, and I want to read this to you. Okay, I received this letter from Mr. Ian Ross. It says, hello, Mr. Smith. I hope this email finds you well, maybe even after bowling. He really listens to the show, doesn't he? (laughs) I continue with Ian's words. I don't mean to take up too much time here, but I wanted to tell you something first and then ask a question that I honestly think you haven't been asked by anyone and show you how big a fan of the Western Magazine nerd that I am. My name is Ian Ross. I've been watching wrestling since November 1984. I even met my former wife at an ECW show. My son is named Owen for Owen Hart was the star of my favorite TV show as a kid. TSN Wrestling, Stampede. When I was a kid, I had a paper route, so I had a disposable income. I would take a bus to the newsstand at downtown Windsor, Ontario monthly so I could grab the newest wrestling magazines of all kinds. The Western Magazine's Wrestling Eye, Wrestling Fury, that one was a bit rough, etc. My memories are clear from those days. Unfortunately, after a few falls induced by seizures and a major accident, My memories can be scattered, but I hold those strong to me. I'm on disability, so I have ample time to myself. One thing that helps my head a lot has been running. While running, I also listen to podcasts. Late last year, while reading a Steve Generelli post on a message board, he said he'd done an episode with you and to look for it. At this point, I found your show and an archive of almost a full year of shows. That episode and subsequent run triggered memories and good feelings. So the next day, I started with your first episode, listened to a new one each day on my runs until I was caught up. It took, I think, until January, February of this year, but each episode I thought had different thoughts and questions. Thank you for helping to trigger all of that for me. Anytime you look at your microphone and don't feel it or wonder who's out there, I would just like to tell you that I am. That 13-year-old kid who read The Steel Cage with Bob Smith on the bus home from the newsstand, and now the old person with memory issues, head damage, and sometimes a feeling that there is nothing out there for him anymore. That person is there, looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you for that. My question, if I may ask, is this, and I hope maybe if you haven't recorded the next episode with Craig Peters, he may know if you don't. And I can't possibly imagine anyone else that has asked you this because only my brain would care about something like this, so here goes. There was an ad in, I want to say, every issue of PWI that I purchased. Maybe it was in the other Western magazines too, but I don't remember. But definitely PWI. 
It was, I think, a full-page ad, and it was telling me that I could be on the cover of my own issue of PWI. That sample cover even had its own sub-headlines that were unique to that particular cover. All you had to do was submit a picture of yourself, and I presume you would receive your copy of you on the cover of PWI in the mail. My question is two parts. Was there an actual magazine you received with your photo on the cover with features and articles in the magazine? And part two, do you know how many people sent for this? Was it a moneymaker? If so, did it drive the design team crazy? Every time I'd see that ad, I always wondered if anybody actually went through with it. I'm sorry this is long, Mr. Smith. Thank you for reading it. I hope at least my question made you scratch your head and wonder how anyone on earth would remember that. But after hearing all of your episodes, I wanted to ask you the most outdated of outdated question that I could. Thank you for your time, Ian. Ian, I don't know what to say. Much like Jim Cornette, who gets uh, on his podcast letters from people who have been a little bit down in their luck, as you have. Well, well. This is the greatest letter I ever received. I really mean that. I, I get tons of stuff in my mailbox, and I try to answer most of it, if it's, you know, prescient to do so. Sometimes I get so busy, it takes me a couple of weeks to get back to people, but I try to get back to people in the uh, outdated wrestling and gmail.com mailbox. You really touched me with this, Ian. Because, you know, before you were the kid on the bus reading The Steel Cage, I was a kid stuffing some wrestling magazine in my school bag reading the Kaiser books and the Western magazines, as much wrestling as I could get my hands on. Something about those wrestling magazines that kind of ties us all together. Whether you're a professional wrestler or way down to people like you and me who uh, were simply fans. And I just want to thank you for listening. Immensely, I want to thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be able to talk to people like you. And uh, I hope someday I get to tell you that in person, some way, somehow. But for now, I just want to give you my sincere gratitude for writing such a wonderful letter. It makes the whole job worthwhile. And yes, you inspired me. You inspired me to start a second podcast. So thank you. I know there's a lot of people out there that listen from all over the world at this point. And the fact that I've come even this far is kind of miraculous in and of itself. But Ian, with every new show, I'll think about you, my man. Hope that you're feeling well and that you're enjoying every episode. I don't know what else to say, but thank you. So with that, let's take a little commercial break and go up to the Great White North, a wonderful country candidate with, with Joseph Cachado, and he's going to tell us how he got involved with a, one of the year's best wrestling books, which you really need to check out, Run With The Bulls. And you also need to check out Eric Johnston's comedy, and you need to check out this interview with Joseph. So we'll be back in a few minutes. Here's a word. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, Wrestling Fans International Association is back. That's right, the premier fan club association of the 1970s and 1980s has been revived and is back in business. Join today. It's free at the WFIA.org. That's T-H-E-W-F-I-A dot org. You can also join us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash groups slash WFIA 1969. All right. It was about four or five episodes ago that we had uh, Eric Johnston on, the author of the brand new book, uh, Run With The Bulls, uh, Three Generations of Sports and Entertainment. And Greg Oliver worked with him on that. But there was a third name on that book cover. And I got interested in that. And his name is our guest today. Um, he's a young man just getting started in his journalism career. But he's, you can already read some of his work on Slam Wrestling, which is the finest wrestling news website out there. I say that without reservation. Um, I talked to Greg about the site um, and he, you know, I talked to him about you a little bit and uh, I'm glad to have you show folks. This is Joseph Cachado. Did I say that right? You did. Perfect. I got it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show and congratulations on the book. Um, Thank you. Is this your first book assignment? It is my very first book. Yes. Wow. That's great. You got to work with Greg Oliver on a wrestling book. That's really cool. Yeah, it's like a dream come true for a wrestling fan. Now, I'm speaking to you for the Great White North. Now, you're, you're Canadian. 
I am, yes. Okay. And that's where Slam Wrestling is is located, obviously. And uh, how's that experience been? Because I really meant that. And I, I, I say it all the time. Slam is the, uh, that's the standard for wrestling news, in my mind anyway. Um, were you a fan of it? How'd you hook up with Slam? So I've always like followed their work in the past. Like they've always had something that I remember as a kid was the Canadian Hall of Fame page that they have where they mm-hmm. Canadian wrestlers. And then it just so happened that I stumbled upon them a couple of years ago when I wrote a story about uh, Smash Wrestling. And like you said, it really is the standard where we, Greg, John, and Bob, those are the three gentlemen that run the site. And they've always taught us that it's pro- proper journalism at the end of the day. Even though it's wrestling, it can be funny at times and a little bit crazy proper journalism is like what we go for with slam and i think they taught me a lot i've been able to cover shows live i cover monday night raw weekly i've written stories about some of the smallest indie like small indie shows small indie rest that don't they don't know about and i've also done stories about more mainstream people like i've interviewed alex riley the wwe star that made his return to wrestling a couple years ago Mm -hmm. i did angelina love with uh, tna so there's been a lot of opportunities there and uh yeah, I think slam for a lot of that. Oh, that's great. You know, it, you, you brought up a bell with me because it's like, um, I, I worked in the newspaper world before I joined PWI, which is the first national magazine I ever worked for. And it was the same with Craig Peters, journalism with a capital J. And that, believe it or not, even though they were wrestling magazines, it's like you say, people go, oh, it's wrestling. But, you know, he was a stickler for good grammar. And so was Stu Sachs, the editor in chief, was sticklers for. You know, a lot of our staffers were from local newspapers. I mean, big newspapers like Newsday and stuff like that. So it, even though it was a wrestling magazine, you, you couldn't give that, you couldn't hand in copy that was like messy or juvenile or not having real editorial standards. And uh, apparently you feel that way too. And so does your company. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to have a good journalism standard. Like from when I started there to now, I feel like Greg was the one that really helped me at the beginning and he really taught me how to create a clean copy of work. And then later on, he trusted me to even edit some work myself. And I used what he taught me to edit other people's work. And I feel like as a whole, like we have a good record with a, as a company at Slam. Absolutely, you do. I, you know, it's funny too. I, I won't say where this was, but about three years ago, I got offered a job on one of the, a pretty well-known wrestling website. And it was that SEO stuff. And I just said, no, I I, I can't cotton to it. After decades of learning how to write and edit i just i just couldn't first of all i'm too lazy to learn something new at this point that's it i'm i've done i've done my thing you know but seriously i can't to me writing isn't about selling stuff and i think that's what seo is i'm i'm just kind of i stuck to my guns and said no i i just can't do it how do you feel about that stuff yeah i agree i think writing it shouldn't be about selling stuff i think it should be like a direct I think news is news. And when you need, there's something that needs to be shared. I think it's a proper way to do it. And I don't think there should be, I don't think journalism, like there has a place for like messiness and like adding details that are necessary. The way I, when I think of news, I think of a clean copy, like straight to the point, cut and paste, like exactly what the people need to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You you use one of my favorite expressions, clean copy. (laughs) I, I, I edited other writers work at, you know, my whole life and i love turning around going hey that's good clean copy you know so it's like you know it's always it's always a pleasure to read something that's well put together so absolutely but you know as an editor i used to enjoy taking a mess and making chicken salad out of it you know what i'm saying it's like something that's really bad grammatically and pretty poorly written and then editing it into something that's good i had a writer who i did an entertainment magazine for 17 years and i had a writer who well knew everything on a certain topic, mm-hmm. but he couldn't write all that well. And I didn't care because what he was giving me was so interesting that I would shape it and turn it into really good columns because he had really good information. Have you ever had a job like that where you had to take uh, fragments of things here and there and make something out of it? Absolutely. I think we had a feature story at Slam like about a couple of years ago. We did it and um, we wrote, put it together. Me and Greg worked on it together. Someone wrote it. He had a lot of great information. It was about a wrestler from way back i think he was, in, was a wrestler from the 50s mm-hmm. and me and greg worked together to kind of he had such a great idea it didn't i don't think he want, came together the way he expected but with our help with him we helped and we created such an amazing story and i think at slam it was one of our top rated stories for like quite a few weeks really yeah it came out really well it was a great feature wow 
Now, how do you, let me ask you something about something. How do you said one of our top rated stories for weeks? How do you determine that? Actually, so um, Greg actually handles all of that. He handles the, um, he follows to see who's, what stories are being the most viewed, what's getting the most clicked. Every Monday, the Slam team, we all chat over an email chain. We hear about the top, it's about the top 20 stories for the week that passed. So that's how we discuss it. Greg checks like viewership, which one got the most clicks, clicks from Google, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. I, I'm just such an admirer of Slam. I mean, I've just, everything from the great uh, photos of certain events and uh, I hate to say this, the obits are always really well done. And, you know, the, the up to the minute news, again, it's it's the thinking person's wrestling website. That's the best way to put that. It is. You know, it's a very mature wrestling re- website as opposed to a lot of the others. The obits, yeah. Like that was one of, when I started doing my, when I did my internship, it was with Slam as well. And, um, Writing an obit was something I had never done before. So I wasn't sure how to do it in like, I don't know, it's weird to do it in a tasteful manner. You want to, I would say, you want to make sure you respect the wrestler, respect the person in wrestling and just write it in a way that comes together. And Greg really helped me with those bits. And I wrote an obit. One of the ones that I remember specifically was about a rest. He was a wrestling fan from uh, DCW. And he became notorious because they called him Piss Jug Mike because he carried around a tea and a jug. And it looked like so they called him piss drug <laughs> passed away back in 2022 he's really young but i put together that a bit and it's it was came together so well because this fan touched so many like wrestlers he had such deep connections like matt cardona left a post about it so so many people that he touched over the years and that a bit really sticks to me because I, I remember it came together like way better than i ever expected when i heard the story i was like this fan like this weird name like what's happening with this but it was came together really well. Probably my favorite little bit. I, I don't want to say favorite. It's not not a good way to put it, but one of them I, I enjoyed putting together. Right. I think we did a good um, job during him. So, who else have you written about on the on the Slam Wrestling website? Oh, so I've done a ton of stuff. So I did the I've done a little bit for the Bush Tracker that passed away. Um, I've done I do a lot of features on indie wrestling. I did that way before. Like while I was still in university, I had a lot more free time before I started working uh, full time, but. I should do a, my uh, features. The first one I ever did was on a wrestler from Winnipeg, Manitoba. His name was Sammy Peppers. He was a teacher by day and an uh, independent wrestler over the week. <laughs> okay. And he was a tag team champion. I wrote that story. Um, I recently did one of the more recent ones I did was on uh, Cody Chun. He's a wrestler in uh, the States. He does a lot of work at Defy. And he was uh, one of the greatest interviews I did because he had a true passion for the wrestling business. Like this, he knew this is what he wanted to do for a long time. And he put so much work into it and just talking to him the way he he studied the craft. And it was it was great to hear that. He was had a big inspiration from Japanese wrestling. And uh that's one of the main things I cover over at Slam as well, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Mm-hmm. I cover a lot of their shows, me and uh John Powell. We do a lot of work together on that with New Japan. And New Japan and WWE are probably the two closest companies I cover, like at this point. Well, you're doing way more than I would suspect a man your age would do. That's great. Um, you know, talking to Eric Johnson about the new book, and by, I want to mention the name of the book again. It's called Rome the Bulls, Three Generations of Sports and Entertainment, which uh, Joseph here is, I don't know what to, how to put your, I guess, co-author, I guess. Is that fair? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, that's what, we, that's what Eric uh, said, yeah, as well, and Greg, oh, yeah. yeah. He had nice things to say about you. He really did. And uh, he said he enjoyed working with both of you. And uh, how was that experience for you? I mean, you're so young, and yet you're writing an article ostensibly about two older wrestlers who are long passed passed away. So that had to be somewhat challenging, I would imagine. It was challenging in a sense, but it was also, I really enjoyed it. And the whole process, like I got to learn so much about the Ontario wrestling scene that I never really knew because growing up i heard my like my grandfather would talk about it my dad would talk about like the independent wrestling shows that would come across like toronto but i actually got to deep dive into it and learn so much about that ontario wrestling scene that i found it so cool like i got to interview so many great names like um that were connected with bullwhip like harry d told us about the shows they would help run the referee from he works in tna's and a few other jobs as well i interviewed um Cashman, Brian Cashman. His dad was a referee as well. Uh, Brian Casibo, I believe his name was. And yeah, so I interviewed him. So I got to learn so much about the Ontario wrestling scene. And it was so cool because it was things that I never 
knew about and like how much independent wrestling ran through Toronto, Hamilton, Buffalo. It's amazing to learn so much about. Yeah, I mean, for us down here in the lower 48, as, as it were, um, people here also don't realize the vibrant wrestling scene in Canada. Alex Robertson, mm-hmm. who used to also work with the Slam, I don't know if she's still contributing. Is she? I believe she does some things. Yeah, some things I do believe she still does. I've heard, I've seen yeah. it a few times, yes. Yeah, she, she used to clue me in on all the indie stuff that was going up in there. I was really impressed. And it was good quality wrestling too. I mean, it was kind of had an old school flavor to it. It wasn't mm-hmm. hardcore or anything like that, but it had it had that modern vibe to it. She really enjoyed it. Yeah. I think it does have an independent scene that doesn't get talked about enough. Like there's some great shows that happen here. I recently went to a Demand Lucha show. And I thought it was really well put together. It was, they build up, one thing about that independent company that I really like is that they build up their champions. They've had like three world champions that have had reigns that lasted a long time and they put on great matches. They made that championship feel so important. So I was there at Parkdale Hall on Queen Street when uh, his name Jack Cartwheel won the championship from Gringo Loco after Gringo Loco held the title for over a year. And even though it's just a small independent show, the roof practically came off the place when he won the title because it was like someone finally beat Gringo Loco. And it was just amazing to see that independent wrestling can become that. People become not connected to it. Wrestling's hot right now. It, I think it's I think it's hot on all levels. I agree. I mean, we just had that massive WrestleMania in Philadelphia, but what I'm finding out through that is that there were peripheral events around Philadelphia that were indies, and they all did great that weekend. Yes, you, I mean everything was full, everything was packed. Um, but I think I think people are really enjoying wrestling right now. Why do you think that is? I have my own philosophy on that, but why do you think everything's so hot right now? You know, I. I've been rec- I don't I feel like it's just been such great product, but I wonder like I still don't I wonder myself why it became so popular again, it feels. I feel like some people are watching wrestling again, but I don't I feel like the product's at an all time high right now. And I feel like a big thing is it's been focused really on storytelling recently, which WWE, someone like company like that, they've always prided themselves on the storytelling. But I feel like there's been history in the past people that aren't always satisfied with the match at the end because they say maybe the match quality doesn't meet the storytelling quality. But I think recently we're reaching a point where the storytelling is and match quality is top notch all around. Mm-hmm. In great promo work, we're seeing great builds. Like I think the Cody Rhodes build to WrestleMania win was so perfectly done. And people might have been somebody lost last year, and seeing what it came to this year, I feel like it made it so much more special. Mm-hmm. I do think some companies still like I think it's hot, but I think there's still some certain companies that I don't know. Like I'm not sold on completely yet. Like I still have my questions about AEW. Well, oh gosh, me too. But we'll get it. We'll get into that a little bit. But I do think it's hot because, yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I think storytelling, like the way wrestlers are being built now, is just so much more intriguing than in the past. And I think that's what draws people in so much more. Like I have friends that haven't watched wrestling in years since they were a kid, but when they they're on TV, they see this Cody Rhodes underdog strap against the heel Rock on Twitter, posting these videos. Like they were drawn back in. Like I had friends that watched WrestleMania for the first time in years just because the way it's been documented and the stories like drew them back in. But there's a believability factor right now that we haven't seen in a long time. Yes, definitely. And I, I think they're building it up by toning it down, to be honest with you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? If things get if things got really over the top in the pandemic era is twenty and twenty one because they were desperate, there are no fans there, and they put on like the cinematic matches and Bray Wyatt being set on fire. Just go down the list. Uh, yeah. Matt Hardy levitating into the ring on, on AEW. There's a lot of just desperation. It felt desperate. I agree. Because bi- the business was bad because there was no business. Mm-hmm. So I think it took some time to calm down after that. You know, I, I think cinematic matches are already pe- passe. I think it's time for a little grit, a little realism. Um, like they said at the end of WrestleMania, uh, Michael Cole says, I love pro wrestling. The words pro wrestling haven't been used in that program in probably in 10 years. Yeah. It's been so a long- there, there was a meaning behind that, I think. And it made me excited because it's like, I think everybody that was there loves pro wrestling too. Exactly. And that's what they call it. Mm-hmm, definitely. I think mm-hmm. yeah, like even just in WWE specifically with that whole storyline with the rock, I think it just added so much. Like I was, I had this conversation with uh, someone a couple weeks ago that like about how, 
things like the rock swearing on tv people might not have liked it but it just i think it worked just because he was the only one doing it and it made him right. like so much more of a bad guy and it adds that realism almost to it it makes you want to boo him and i think they've just been doing a great job with that just kind of going back to like not like i wouldn't say it's not an attitude error level and i don't think it'll ever be like that again but just letting him kind of have more create creative freedom when it comes to promos things like that i think it's been adding a lot to the product i agree i do agree Mm -hmm. and you know you know what i think a real turning point was in the promotion was that boxing like uh press conference they had there were no matches you remember the thing on peacock it was just a press conference yes big blown up five thousand people their press conference that worked like gold oh People, it was in the, they had people in the palm of their hands that night, I think. They really did, didn't they? I mean, it, I, I never saw anything quite like it in wrestling. And I thought it was a real turning point for WWE. Just that special. Exactly. Because it it was fresh. It was new. It looks, it looked, first of all, it looked gorgeous. I mean, hmm. and, and there's another thing with WWE. If you've noticed, their camera work is getting more advanced. The things they're doing with pacing and timing is, is changing. Um following wrestlers in from, in from outside the arena into the arena or following from backstage with a single camera all the way back into the ring yeah. as if you're walking the, the tunnel. The stuff has been very vibrant, really good looking. I'm sure you, I don't know if you, I'm sure you saw the Sami Zayn entrance from Raw this past week. No, I didn't see it this week. Uh, the, I think I've, me, I think so. And a lot of people are like, I've seen saying it. I think it was the best entrance in Monday Night Raw history. Really? They followed, the match ended prior to him. Jey Uso had a promo. They followed Jey Uso out of the arena, outside the Bell Center in Montreal. And they find Sami Zayn standing on the street looking at the sign. And they had one camera that followed Sami saying he's going to come back in the building he started in. His hometown, they followed him through the crowd, through the fans. In the, and they walked him all the way down the stairs with one camera into the crowd. He went through the whole arena with a Canadian flag on his back. And just the camera work was unreal to follow him from outside on the sidewalk all the way in the ring was impeccable oh thank goodness for my dvr man i have i had to miss it because i was doing another interview that night <laughs> but it's like i'm definitely gonna once i get home i'm gonna check that out because that yep. sounds great the, you see what i mean it's you know I mean? there is real thought being put into it and yet it seems more realistic the fancier it looks i've never seen anything quite like what's going on now i agree yeah it's something like I, I said. The cinematic matches just struck, struck me as hokey and fake. I'm nothing, like, nothing with this new way of presenting it visually seems fake. I agree. It just seems realistic. It's, it's just another way of looking at things. It, it's been really exciting the last couple of months. It really has. Definitely. Um, but I, I do want people to go out and get the book. It's called uh, "Run with the Bull." Yes. Um, Greg Oliver's name is on it. Joseph's name is on it. Of course. Um. Eric Johnson, who I, he is a bundle of energy and a load of laughs. And I like the fact that he has no off switch. He's very funny. I mean, how, what was it like working with him? Oh, he's hilarious. I personally, I did a lot of writing about Eric. So I sat on the phone with him like a couple hours at a time, multiple times. And he really is just like, I think he's just like a naturally like loud personality, but he's hilarious. He, mm -hmm. he doesn't really have an off switch. And like his personality is just, it makes you happy when you're talking to him because he's just so excited about everything. And it's just such a great personality to have. It really is. You know, he's funny. He He's not grading at all, though. He's no. loud, but he's not grading. He's, he walks that tightrope really well. Yeah, he does. Like stuff. There are some comics that are just, hey, hey, and they scream and, you know, and they have to curse constantly. Yeah. Eric's not like that. He's a little more subtle. He he's, does great slice of life comedy, too. Did you get a chance to check any of his comedy out? I did, yeah. I've been I've checked it out on his social media, and then like even we had a book launch, and he was on stage maybe like five minutes, but he cracked a few jokes. I brought a lot of my family with me. I'm Italian, and mm -hmm. he made a joke that oh, I know a lot of people are there listening to the Z1035 Euro mix on the way home, and <laughs> it was so quick and funny. And it's like he knows how to. He's so witty with it that it's he's very good. Like it's a great sense of humor. It really is. So I want people to check out uh, Eric and check out this book. Uh, Greg will thank you. Joseph will thank you. And Eric will really thank you because, you know, they all three, it was a labor of love for Eric. It, it, and I, I want to emphasize, it's a look back at two wrestlers that probably most of you have never heard of. But on top of it, it it's it's unsurprisingly moving book because of the circumstances of Danny Bullwhip Johnson's life and his relationship with the son and 
the grandfather that Eric never knew, never knew and never met him. And, you know, for Eric to discover all these things later on in his life, I think it was a big deal for him. Yeah, definitely. Like we, the way we tried to format the book was me and Greg would get like the nitty gritty information, the facts, like things that were like more to the point, the journalism aspect of it. And then we'd present that to Eric and let him put his own personal touch on it and like his own personal feelings. And I think that added so much to the book. It's, it's an innovative way of doing it. You don't see that often. And it allowed for Eric to put his personal feelings into the book because there was things he like never heard, never knew. And stories that he got to hear for the first time that were just like his real emotion came out. And I think that's what made the book so special. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, I read a br- lot of wrestling books. I have authors on all the time. And I want you to know right now, as we sit here, this is my wrestling book of the year so far because Thanks. it's out of, it's out of left field. It's, I actually got to see bull Johnson work back in the seventies. Wow. Okay. I'm old enough to have seen him work and work a lot. He worked around the East a lot. So I got to see him. And to me, when I heard him, Greg told me he was doing a book on, he, Greg was on the show a few months ago and he told me he was doing a book on, I said, bull Johnson. <laughs> Cause he was a prelim guy basically. Yeah. And I was like, this is too good. I remember Bill Johnson because I, me and some friends used to get together and go to a bar in my hometown and watch the IWA wrestling. And he, Bill Johnson was on virtually every episode of that show. I'm sure. So it was like, my God, it's taking me back to my high school years, for, but not about Bruno San Martino or chief J Strongbow. No, it's about Bill Johnson. I said, I can't wait to read this book. So um, I'm, I'm so glad that Greg hooked me up with everybody here because it's like, this is a good piece of work and I think it's entertaining and I think people really need to read this. So I'm, I'm trying to hype this book because Thank you. I appreciate that. it's totally different folks. It's, this is not your usual, you know, let's say breaking kayfabe biography. It's different. It's a personal, it's a personal story about what uh, Eric as life has been through with the wrestling influence in his life. Mm-hmm. Imagine being the son and grandson of a professional wrestler. I can't even fathom that. Yeah, like he grew up with Johnny Canine at his house, practically. Like, <laughs> and it's stories like that. Like a little kid, like no idea who he's. Well, like at the time, he had no idea who the type of person he was talking to. But that's like one of the most notorious wrestling and gangsters of all time, criminal, whatever you want to call him. But mm-hmm. again, story like so many things that from his childhood that he described it as a circus. And it's, I think that's the best way to put it is life was like a circus and then molded him into this amazing comedian today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He channeled his energies in a good, positive way, I think, you know? Absolutely. So anyway, now I got a 22 year old guy here. And a few months ago, I had a 22 year old young woman, uh, Kimmy Soko on the show. And I I relish moments like this because most of my guests are pretty much around my, my age frame, you know? Being a nostalgia podcast, we talk about stuff we did years ago and saw years ago. But I keep my eye on today's product. And we we just talked about WWE. I want to talk about some indies and AEW right now. Because AEW is on, has gone through these past few weeks one of the most embarrassing sequences. I, I mean, everybody's got the same opinion about bringing back the, I guess it was the all-in backstage videotape that went nowhere and bomb royally and it's not a good look. What do you think about all that? I think AW is, has argue, I think in my opinion has the best roster in wrestling with the, some of the worst like management and booking in wrestling. I think they have such a big roster that relies so much on their money that they don't know. It feels like they don't know what to do with everyone. And they keep mm-hmm. finding people and bringing people in, but there's just no direction. I feel like with every single start, like I feel like people come in and then they have this big debut. They have a few crazy matches and then what happened to them? Where'd they go? And you don't hear from them for a while. I think the whole all in situation, I think that was embarrassing in my opinion, like for the company to have to air that on TV. I don't know. I feel like it just kind of proved like the whole CM, what CM Punk said was true. If anything, mm-hmm. they, yeah. Well, I think they made him look better than they made Jack Perry look, whatever they're trying to accomplish here. Yeah, but you you know, here's the thing. You said they had to show it. They didn't have to show it. This was somebody's idea. I think we both know whose idea it probably was. And it was a really bad idea. I mean, it went nowhere. It made no sense. And it only kind of verified, like you said, what CM Punk has been saying all along. 
So I just, I just, I, I uh, Tony Khan needs to be a bigger man and drop the whole damn thing about CM Punk. Just he, he's not on the roster anymore. He got released. It's done, and right. it's over. Just, just yeah. do your own thing. Yeah, like I don't know. I think AW. I, there was a point I think where AW was great. I think they were a very good wrestling show at one point. I think it would be like, like twenty. Right around the pandemic, arguably enough, I think WWE had a little bit of a rough patch during the pandemic, but I think AW kind of found their stride in that scenario. Um, and I used to watch it religiously, like every week I would tune into Dynamite, but just felt like as they got bigger roster wise, company wise, the product took a dip. And I just think you can have every star in the world, but if you don't know how to book them, what's the point of paying all these people? And eventually, the money's only going to get them so far. Like, if they're not filling arenas the way it is right now, I don't know how much longer they're going to last. A good friend of mine loves wrestling. I was telling him yesterday, like, I don't know if by next summer, AEW will still be a company. And that's, that's a wonder I actually have because I understand they have all this money to spend, but eventually, you're going to have to realize you're not getting the return on income and move on with this, the idea because I just don't think it's working out the way they expected it to. And, you know, TV being TV, if TBS and TNT said it's enough, Mm-hmm. You know, shows do get canceled in the middle of a contract. I mean, that that can happen. So we'll we'll see. I just it just seems like a mess right now, you know. But you know, the, here's the other thing about modern. Well, I don't. Yeah, I'll call it modern wrestling. Today's wrestling. The strategy, uh, the ring psychology in the matches has gone completely haywire. Too much stuff is re- repeated over and over. Like even in WWE, does somebody have to go through a table on every edition of, of Raw? You know, the ringside table, the announcer's table. Yeah. Also, um, if someone is a, is running to the ring to save someone else, why play the ring music and telegraph it? You see, it doesn't make logical. It's not logical. It's so, it doesn't make any sense. At WrestleMania, the first when Jay Uso came out to stop Jimmy, the first thing I said was, "Why is his music playing?" Right, exactly. I think everybody says that. It, 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 it just, it's again, it's, it's illogical. Mm-hmm. We'll see him, folks, or yeah. WWE. We will see them. Yeah. We know who they are. When they attack, we'll know who they are. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. funny too because they have people coming out of the crowd and they never get music when they do that. It's only when they run down the ramp. <laughs> So, you know, yeah. but you know what I'm saying? And also the, the spots, the high impact spots, let's say someone's standing up on the turn on, on the top turnbuckle. Mm-hmm. He's about to dive on three or four people who stand there for 40 seconds waiting to be dived upon. All of wrestling is guilty of that. And it, it it's, you know, for, for a little ooh in the middle of a match or a little, a little, you know, a little, a little excitement. I, I, it's, it's, it's questionable. Te- it's telegraphing what's going on. To me, the suspension of disbelief is what made wrestling fun when I was younger. Some people actually believe the whole damn thing back when I was younger. If you can believe that, my friend, but it's true. Yeah. And um, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like you want to see, like Jim Cornish says, you want to see two people having a fight for a logical reason, and and the, that action should look like a fight. And to me, too much of today's stuff does, unless it is, of course hardcore death matches which i don't believe in at all i i a lot of people do a lot of people enjoy them but i just uh i think it's taking i i'll just say this i think today's wrestlers take too many risks what do you think i agree i think some wrestlers definitely take it a little too far like the first person that just jumped into my head was darby allen mm-hmm. and how he puts his body on the line to like a way like this guy's not going to be able to walk in 10 15 years and sometimes it's like the spots that people don't think are that bad that look just brutal. Like him taking that, I don't even remember like the body slam from Christian on a pair of steel, like a set of steel steps. Mm-hmm. I know the steps aren't like solid steel or whatever, but still like he's taking it from like six feet in the air, dropping back first with no protection. Like it's got to hurt. Even mm-hmm. him onto that glass, the last, the stained glass match. It served its purpose and like it gave the fans that crazy moment, but he's not going to be the same for something like that. Well, I hear you. And there's another thing, too. Um, I call it the superstar Billy Graham factor. Superstar Billy Graham uh, had a bloodborne disease from bleeding in wrestling matches. You know, you know, and I think a Canadian um, Devin Nicholson contacted hepatitis from blood to blood contact. 
And there's a lot of blood in AEW, and I worry that something like that might happen again. And it amazes me that they, people haven't learned from the experiences of guys who've gotten sick from blood contact. Do you, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I think like blood kind of means nothing in AEW because it happens in every match. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not against, like, I'm not against, I think bleeding in wrestling has its points. Like, I think it has to be a, like, I don't know. I feel like if it's in a big moment, a culmination of a feud, like, okay, there's blood, that's whatever. Like, it, ha- it adds to the story. If you're just bleeding on a random TV match with someone that you, you're fighting for the first time in like a year, what's the point? Mm-hmm. Right. That risk. Like something like it sticks in my mind, like Japan, like Japanese wrestling. I followed NJ, NJPW really closely, and they only like you never see blood in their product. You saw blood when it's like a big match that's happening, like the culmination of a feud. Like recently, like they did when Will Osprey was leaving Japan, his facts United Empire faced uh, the bullet club war dogs in a steel cage match the first cage match in japan in years and it was there was a lot of blood in that match but because it doesn't happen ever in japan that match felt so much more like special and it showed that these guys were really having their culmination they hated each other i think in that situation it's okay because it adds something to the feud but when it's just the random match yeah, i completely agree there's no need for that right you know back in the day and i hate to you know, be, be an old man, but um, of course I am an old man, but that's another story. But <laughs> it, it, blood was used quite a bit. If you looked at the magazine covers, they run like every other cover. It was a big selling point in the 70s and 80s. But when you actually went to your local arenas to see the, the regular cards, and back then there were regular cards every month or every couple of weeks, you wouldn't see blood on every card. Mm-hmm. You'd see it on every third or fourth card, which made it special which made the fans feel like hey that that villain is hurting my favorite wrestler that's what blood was for Mm -hmm. and not just to i don't know i don't understand the philosophy of blood in today's wrestling in aew particularly i because like you said everybody's bleeding like you know ketchup packets and i'm like well well, uh, every match or every other match it just feels that way it does it does and it feels very unnecessary in a sense and it's just kind of like they're doing it just to do it, it feels like they just want that pop of the blood. But after a while, like you're not going to get those pops anymore if it's happening all the time. But I think it's also another way of we're saying we're not WWE. Yeah. So, you know, they had Cody Rhodes bleeding about three, three or four weeks ago, and that was rare for WWE television. I think when AEW started, they were their big selling point. We're not the WWE. We're hard of hitting and all this other stuff. And I think that's where the blood use came from, really. They wanted to be so diametrically opposite to the uh what mcmahon and company were doing that i think that that was a big motivating factor in that regard yeah i think when it's like someone like john moxley like he (laughs) he really doesn't want to be dean ambrose anymore so he bleeds in every match but it's just like Mm -hmm. it just doesn't i don't see a point to it anymore yeah most of us don't so you're not alone see we're not see you're younger but we we have a very similar mindset here you know it's like we want our wrestling to be hard hitting. We want it to be realistic, right? We want storylines that make sense. Yeah. Good really. storyline will attract you. Yeah. Um I think a story like I think a storyline that I like, I'm a big fan of like I love the underdogs. Right? I think everyone loves the underdog story in a sense. But mm-hmm. I think if it's done in a right way, and I think I like a longer story than a shorter story. Like I think two of my favorite stories in wrestling. In recent years, like arguing all time, just because like what I've the product I know, I just gave a lot of to AEW. I talked bad about them quite a bit, but I think the Hangman Adam Page story was done perfectly, mm-hmm. in the same sense the way the Cody Rhodes story was done perfectly, where they took a year long build, built him from like the odd man out, the one that would never be the champion, built him back up to the top, lost his friends along the way, but at the end of it, everyone came behind him to find him to become the champion like the way jay uso the undertaker john cena came to help cody at wrestlemania it was like when hangman and the young bucks stood behind him and told him hit kenny omega with the buckshot lariat finish the job and i think it something like that is just a great story when you let someone build their underdog story but it has to be a good amount of time like i'm not believe it like this might be an unpopular opinion i didn't like the Sami Zayn story heading into wrestlemania because I thought they tried to build an underdog story in like three weeks. 
And I'm just, I don't think Sami Zayn is the underdog people think he is anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you made a good point about the storyline. So I grew up watching a wrestling program, WWWF, it was called way back when. And they would run entire programs with no angles. The entire program, you can watch this stuff on Peacock, mm-hmm. was squash matches. Yeah, Some shows had no main event. And it was simply to display the talents of the wrestlers against lesser wrestlers. And that, that's the way they, you know, they made people look strong and what have you and built them up. Um, there, there, was a, there was a philosophy to how they booked on the East Coast in that, let's say a new heel would come in and they always had a babyface champion, Bruno or Bob Backlund or Pedro Morales or whatever. So then a new heel would come in and he would beat up a bunch of tomato cans, maybe have them carried out on stretchers and stuff like that. And then they would face a secondary face like uh, Dominic DiNucci or Ivan Putski and beat them to earn a title shot. That was basically all the angles I watched for five years. That was it. That's how they handled it back then. And I, I, I know a lot of young people watch this stuff from back then and go, there's nothing going on. It's just a bunch of squash matches. But everything was very championship-oriented back then. You know, the, the, the big prize. And there were very few belts. Yeah. You know, the, everything was territorial. So you had a champion and maybe a, a secondary champion and a tag team champion. And that was it for the entire organization. So everything in that regard, I, I almost wish once in a while they would put matches on that aren't angled at all. Yeah, Like it doesn't have to be a, a rivalry going into every match. Just pit, pit two even people, athletes against each other, be, be they men or women, and let them go. I, I got no problem with that. Well, you think that's... Yeah, I think to make it milder, would that go over once in a while? No, I think that's a great idea. I actually say this quite often as well because I don't like when a wrestler comes back or they're trying to build a wrestler up and they just feed him local talent every week and have him squash him in like 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. A wrestler to come back and like work his way back to the top, like Sheamus returned to WWE on Monday Night Raw and he could have came back and just squashed somebody in two minutes. So they put him up against Ivar and he had like a 15 minute great match like they went back and forth they seemed even two big guys hard hitting and it made him come back he got the win and it made his win feel so much more convincing like he's ready to be back mm-hmm. if he beat up some random guy that no one's ever heard of in two minutes what does that matter oh he hit the broke he can still hit a bro kick well who cares you see him against ivar he had a challenge in front of him and he was able to overcome that challenge and I think they should keep doing that week by week until he eventually gets into a storyline because that's going to make me care about him so much more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just just re- reintroduce him, so to speak, like you say. Yeah. You know, that makes sense. But I'm just saying, let's just throw, you know, forget titles and all that. Picture in WWE, picture, um, and forget forget the bad guy, good guy thing. Just picture, let's throw Chad Gable in with... Um, AJ Styles. You just let him go. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Just let him go without any build up. These two, we're going to face these two guys off. But it, it seems like there's always got to be some type of backstage rigmarole, some kind of controversy, some kind of betrayal. Why not just let two guys go? Yeah, just let or the- two women go. I mean, you know what I'm saying? What do you think of that? I mean, just let them put them in a ring and let them work. Yeah, let, it'd be a great way to showcase some of the talent that maybe doesn't get utilized all the time and put them over with the fans. Like, they might be great talents, but they might not have the fan behind them. But a match mm-hmm. like that would make people care. When you said that, it randomly stuck out to me. I remember, like, WrestleMania 24, they had the match where, like, there wasn't really any build to it. It was just kind of SmackDown versus Raw, Batista versus Umaga. There was no build to that match. Right. It kind of just went out there at WrestleMania and they had a. 20 minute great match because they were two even competitors in my opinion and you let them go and it kind of just like oh you don't need a storyline for this match because it's just mm-hmm. guys that can work they're right. going to see that they can work what's the point of a storyline well you know there's a lot of things they did in the old days that they don't do now you never see a count out victory oh never <laughs> you never see a draw very true a draw they used to have draws on virtually every card a 20 minute draw or a 15 minute draw just the bell rang. There was no decision. It's a draw. They'd raise both hands. Yeah, I think they'd riot if he did that now. Fans no. are not conditioned for that at all. You don't see that a lot now. No, you don't. And I, it's like I kind of miss it because with a draw, you can you can you can sh- highlight both guys and make them both look great. That's to go back to it again. That's what I love about 
New Japan because they do draws right. quite frequently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what sets. I New Japan's a company yeah. that's really set themselves like they pride themselves on great wrestling, not so much storytelling, but great wrestling, and they do a great job with that. And every time they have in the New Japan Cup every year, there's always a few draws in that tournament or the G1 Climax, and those draws are always just fantastic matches. I get to showcase two guys that can go and they maybe don't get the spotlight that they always deserve but in that match for 30 minutes they're beating the hell out of each other and there's no winner but they both came out of that match 10 times stronger than when they went in yep new japan, new japan is the most sports oriented i think yeah organization out there in the whole world i mean it's just it's all it's retained it's been around forever and it's retained their own flavor all these years even though it's fancier and more colorful Mm-hmm. It's still a very sports-minded group there, and I hope they never change because they're very singular in what they do. You know, there's not a lot, a lot of people like them. Yeah, I think we're getting a revamp in New Japan right now. Like it's kind of we're seeing a new era kind of be ushered in, and I think it's we're in for a new look in New Japan. But I think they're still keeping their same idea, like the sports oriented. That's what I love. But we're seeing new stars, new young guys coming in. I think it's going to be a it's going to be a fun company to watch in the near future. Well, Joseph, let me tell you something. You know your stuff, kiddo. I, I mean, it's very refreshing to speak to you, and uh, I, I'm impressed with your your wealth of knowledge for somebody so young. It seems like you got your finger on the pulse. Where do you see yourself in a decade? What would you like to be doing? Uh, I just I love writing, and I want to be able to write forever. Like that's something I want to do for a long time. I just I enjoy it. I think not to too much more, but I think I'm pretty good at it, and I just. I love it. Like whether it be any type, like I love writing about wrestling. That's something I always want to do. I want to write about sports. I want to write about like base. I love even just covering the news. Like I'm, I'm a journalist at heart and it's what I love to do. And I hope I can find my way into an outlet, a newspaper, a online call, anything that can, will allow me to write. Cause if I can write and get, make a living out of it, that's like my dream. That's exactly what I want. Well, let me tell you something, my friend. I'm very impressed with you. And if a schmo like me could be a writer and editor for over 40 years, you can do it. You can definitely do it, man. I Because I've read your stuff now, and I'm so impressed with you. And I'm glad that Greg uh, pointed me your way because uh, the book is fabulous. And it's that's a heck of a way to get started in this whole wrestling thing. And I hope you, I hope you stick with wrestling, too. We need more journalists out there wrestling. I mean, real journalists who want to cover the meat and potatoes stuff. And uh, I, I, it would be kind of cool if you continue on with the ring stuff. I, I like that. I hope so. I, I do. Like, I love wrestling. I love wrestling since I was four years old. And I want to be able to, if I can combine that with my work, that's something that I'll always be passionate about. So if I can find a way to do that forever, it'd be definitely in my cards. Very good. Well, I'll tell you what. This is... Uh, this is Joseph Cachado, and would you come back to the show sometime? Absolutely. Yeah, this is great. No, seriously, I would love to have you back. We'll talk about other things that aren't, you know, we'll, we'll see you in a couple of months and check in with you and uh, find out what's going on. And we'll talk about maybe some stuff that's in the news. How does that sound? That sounds great. I that's love it. Folks, this is a Joseph Cachado. The book is Run With The Bull, Three Generations of Sports and Entertainment. And it's all about um, Eric Johnson's life in wrestling. And now we're going to discover Joseph Cachado's life in wrestling. And it's a very exciting thing to watch. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. This is Joe Walsh. One thing I do when I'm not playing rock and roll is get on the air as an amateur radio operator. Also called ham radio is a communication service provided by ordinary people just like you and me. We have a national emergency communication system in place 24-7, 365. Find out more about amateur radio at ARRL.org slash what is ham radio. See you on the air. You know why I like doing shows like this? It takes me back to when I was with Pro Wrestling Illustrated and, and writing the introducing features in the Wrestler magazine. So many young stars I got to deal with. Now, not that long ago, I introduced you all to uh, Tyler Peters on this show. I introduced you to the young Kimmy Sokol on this show, two people that I think have great futures in wrestling. And now it's Joseph Cachado, who I think is going to have a tremendous future as both the writer 
And if he sticks with wrestling, something wrestling involved. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch them all develop and continue to move on in their lives in wrestling. I hope they all do as good or better than I was lucky enough to do. So that's it for this one. I love Canada. I love Canada. I really do. And I'm grateful for everybody up there in the Great White North who listens to us every week. There's more than a few of you, and I want to I want to give you my appreciation for that. It's really special to me. Outdated Wrestling Hour. Buzzsprout.com is our website where you can hear every episode. We have the Outdated Wrestling Hour fan club for phenomenal for you can get involved with this silly thing and help keep us on the uh, podcast waves, as it were, and just keep the show going. So if you'd like to join, all the information is out, datedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. Write to us at outdatedwrestling at gmail.com. We have a new show, the Outdated Entertainment Hour. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. There's a teaser episode up right now. Just look for it wherever you get your podcast. Well, actually, right now, just go to Spotify or the website. Go to either Spotify, because I'm not sure what, what networks we'll have up. We'll have all of them just like with this show, but it takes some time. So for now, we're on Spotify and a new website, Outdated Entertainment Hour does dot buzzsprout.com. That's Outdated Entertainment Hour dot buzzsprout.com. If you'd like to hear some talk about something other than wrestling, we'll be there at least monthly to begin. And I'm really looking forward to making that show develop, just like we did this one. And we wouldn't have developed any of these shows if it wasn't for you guys out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to the program every single week. Find us on Facebook. I'm the one singing with B.B. King. Find me on Twitter if you can. <laughs> Bob Smith is a really simple name, but you should be able to find me. I'm the old long-haired rascal in little, in little Ralph photo, you know what I'm saying? So in any event, we hope you really like this show. We hope you liked the comedy show last time, and we hope you like every show moving forward of the Outdated Wrestling Hour. It's a thrill to put it together, and we got a lot of cool stuff coming up, some stuff you may not expect in the next several months. So hang with us if you would. My name is Bob Smith. Thank you for being here. And like one of my musical heroes, Ringo Starr, always says, Peace and love, brothers and sisters. Thank you.